Charles Darwin was the first to recognize the evolutionary significance of sex. He came to it because his theory of natural selection had a major problem. It beautifully explained why all polar bears have heavy coats. Over time, any trait that improves an individual's chances of survival should spread through the entire population. But it offered no help in explaining the wild extravagances found throughout nature, like the peacock's tail. Yeah, Darwin had a real problem with peacocks. In fact, he once said, the sight of a peacock makes me sick, because he really didn't understand how it could evolve. An extreme reaction, perhaps. But it is hard to see a peacock's tail as something other than an impediment to his survival. They're heavy. <laughs> um, they're difficult to carry around. They take a lot of energy to grow. Uh, they're conspicuous. And basically, they're going to slow an animal down if it's running away from a predator. And it wasn't just the peacock's tail that Darwin's theory of natural selection couldn't explain. There were also the elaborately ornamented carapaces of beetles, and the Baroque extravagance of butterflies, and even the delicate songs of birds. Theologians of his day argued that God created ornate flowers and feathers to inspire man's wonder and devotion. Darwin was convinced there had to be an evolutionary explanation. Just as there had to be an evolutionary explanation for why so many of nature's ornaments are seen only on males. If natural selection is operating on all organisms the same, why is it in nature that you can see differences between males and females? And these differences are actually quite large. Things like antlers or large body size in males that are clearly connected to maleness or femaleness, as if there were two paths. And this really doesn't make sense if you accept evolution by natural selection. It should be operating the same on everybody. It took him several decades to think of it, but eventually he happened upon the idea of sexual selection, which is really Darwin's most ingenious idea, I think. These ornaments are not for our good, they're to advertise each individual's fitness, its goodness as a mate to the opposite sex of its own species. In a sexually reproducing species, survival is no good if you don't find a mate. If you don't convince somebody that you're good enough to copulate with, to have offspring with, your genes will die with you. You won't leave any descendants. Darwin saw two strategies at work in the courtship idiosyncrasies of different species. For males, it's competition. For females, it's choice. Males fight for access to or control over the females themselves or a resource females need, like food or territory. Sometimes this competition gets downright nasty. But it's just as likely the males of a species will follow the path epitomized by John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, the path of the peacock, seduction through sexual display. This is where female choice comes in. Would expect that the female who invests more per egg, per offspring, should be much more choosy about who she has offspring with, who she combines her genes with. Whereas the male, who's investing so little, you would expect that he wouldn't care so much. Darwin's contemporaries had no trouble with male competition. But females actively directing evolution through their choice of mates, that was too much. This was the aspect of sexual selection that Victorians really had trouble with. They couldn't imagine that mere female animal brains could be shaping something as, as grand and important as, as evolution itself. 
in those days um, females didn't have choices um, males decided who they were to marry for example you know and f uh, females really didn't actually have that much say in the matter so radical was the idea of female choice that it was more than a century before anyone tested it Marion Petrie's experiments with peacocks were among the first. According to sexual selection theory, peacocks grow their tails because peahens pay attention to them. And peahens pay attention because only a healthy, fit, strong peacock can afford to grow one. To test that, Petrie measured the tail lengths of a captive population of peacocks. Then she charted exactly which males the females chose over an entire mating season. Her data left little doubt. To peahens, size matters. Next, Petrie tried reducing the number of eye spots in some otherwise well-endowed tails. The result was a lonely mating season for the trimmed birds. Finally, Petrie started playing matchmaker we paired females with males with big trains and we paired females with males with small trains. And then we looked at how being paired to a male with a big train, what effect that had on the performance of, of um, the female's offspring. And what we found was, is that if you were mated to a male with a, an elaborate train, your offspring survived a lot better. Um, paternity does matter. Peacocks are a classic case of evolution operating through sexual selection. Males compete for the opportunity to mate, and females hold out for the best genes. When females choose a trait that is an honest indicator of good genes, that trait spreads throughout the population over generations. It can also become highly exaggerated. It's all a logical consequence of the differing reproductive strategies of males who have lots of sperm and females who have fewer eggs. In the great island of New Guinea, there are 42 different species of birds of paradise, each more bizarre than the last. This forest is so rich that nourishing food can be gathered very quickly. That leaves the male six-plumed bird of paradise with time to concentrate on other matters, like tidying up his display area. Everything must be spick and span. is ready. Very impressive, but no one is watching. The superb bird of paradise calls to attract a female. And he has more luck. But what does he have to do to really impress her? You can't touch this. My, 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 my music hit me so hard. 
She retires to consider her verdict. It's hard not to feel deflated when even your best isn't good enough. <laughs>